Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. I'll ask you to stand, please, for the reading of the word. Genesis 13, and Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold, and he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, as the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That concludes the reading. My text is there in the twelfth verse. These words, Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. And I want to try to talk to you this morning on the subject drifting, drifting. We're certainly happy that Brother Englert could come and be with us in the camp, and I want to ask him to pray for me, please, before I preach. Oh, God. Oh, God, help us with pray. Yes, oh God, help us, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The story of Lot is entwined with the story of the life of Abraham, the father of the faithful. And I like to study the life of Abraham. And as I look at the life of Abraham, I find three great epics in his spiritual life. The first one I found was separation. God called him to separate from family and home and friends. There was a separation. But then the next great spiritual epic that I found in Abram's life was justification. And that was by faith. He believed in God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Then the third epic I found in the spiritual life of Abraham was perfection. When he was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto him and said, Walk thou before me, and be thou perfect. But Lot never made the grade spiritually. Instead, somewhere along the line, he began to drift. Surely he felt throbbings of heart and the tug of the Holy Spirit toward the highlands of spiritual living. I pastored people back across the years uh, whom I am sure somewhere in their past managed to strike a compromise with their heart's holier longings uh, and settled down uh, to a lukewarm, mediocre Christianity uh, totally unworthy of themselves uh, and of the Lord they profess to serve. 
I want to tell you, friend, drifting is dangerous. Drifting is dangerous. Uh, the Bible uses things to demonstrate and illustrate those dangers. Uh, it talks about hidden rocks uh, that speak of its unseen danger. Uh, it talks about waterless clouds uh, that speak of its false promise. Uh, it speaks of autumnal trees uh, that tell of its barren profession. Uh, it speaks of raging waves which speak of its wasted effort. It speaks of wandering stars that tell of its aimless course. Drifting, drifting is dangerous. And as I watched in the Word of God with profoundness, the drift of Lot, I think I saw there four Ds that mark epics in his drift away from God. And the first one I found was deflection. Deflection. What is deflection anyway? It's a slight change of direction. It's a slow turning away. You remember reading in Genesis chapter 12 how Abraham took Lot and all that were with him and went down into Egypt. It was not according to God's will. Now, Abraham made a full recovery from Egypt. He got back from his deflection into Egypt. But it, be, it seems apparent from the pattern that emerged in Lot's life that he never got back on course again after that slight deflection in his life. And I began to think, what was there in Egypt that would have deflected him, made a slight turning away? What was there? And I think there were three things there in Egypt that would appeal to Lot. And no doubt all of them had a tremendous effect in his life. And the first one was pageantry. Pageantry. What does that word mean? Well, the dictionary tells us that pageantry is a splendid show, a gorgeous display, pomp. Now, friend, Egypt had that. Egypt was the leading nation in the world at that time. They were a great nation, and there was a gorgeous display. There was pomp. There was pageantry like Abraham and Lot had never seen. But there's another part to the definition of pageantry. It also means mere show, empty display. And it seems that Abraham learned the whole definition. He saw through the bright lights, the sparkle, the show. He saw it was empty. There was nothing of reality and substance there. But Lot seemed to miss that second part. There was an appeal down in Egypt to the aesthetic nature. And you know, civilization brings advances in the area of aesthetics. It brings advances, and that includes music. Music, the, old, the, the heathen out there in the jungle uh, hollows out a log and puts a skin over the end of it and beats on it and calls it music. But as civilization advances, uh, they began to refine their instruments and, and uh, their music uh, becomes, uh, becomes more advanced. And finally, we get to what some people call the peak in, in classical music, uh, uh, the, uh, the advance in the realm of music. Uh, but I want to tell you, friend, we need to be careful that we don't get distracted and pulled aside in this area of music, there are three parts to good music. Good music has to have all three of them, melody, harmony, and rhythm. It takes all three to have good music. Now the rhythm, the rhythm appeals, uh, it appeals to the animal nature. That rhythm, that beat, uh, and it's never to predominate. Because when the beat is dominant, uh, the appeal is always to the flesh. I've had men tell me they sat in the tavern drinking while they played songs like Rock of Ages. And what a friend we have in Jesus. 
said you'd think that would put you under conviction, but that beat, that driving beat, there was an appeal to the spiritual there at all. It was appeal to the flesh. And all oh, when it begins to get into the church and that predominant beat, there's something wrong with that kind of music. Amen. God help us not to let the jungle beat in. Amen. Now we need some rhythm. You have to have that to have music. Amen. But, but it can't predominate. Oh, yes, when, the, when that, the music tries to get in your feet, you know, the kind that makes you want to jitterbug a little bit, you know, makes you want to tap your feet instead of get blessed in your soul. Oh, yes, and then, and then there's harmony, harmony in music. That appeals to the aesthetic nature of man, the beautiful. And uh, I, I, I just tell you that uh, there's something to me beautiful about classical music. All the harmonies. But I'll also tell you, you can listen to that and listen to that till it'll drain you spiritually. It surely will. Oh, yes. The aesthetic nature, such an appeal. My, wife, uh, my father has a brother that sang in the number one barbershop quartet in America. They've sung in the White House to the president. They've sung, you know, just all. And uh, those men have perfect harmony. Just, it's just almost spine tingling to hear their harmony as those four men sing. It's just so harmonious. And they sing all, predominantly sing Christian songs. That's, that's the predominance of their music, songs that we're familiar with. But they're not Christian men. They're not, no, they're not anything close to it. But they can sing all of that. And people get such a thrill and such a charge out of that. It appeals to the aesthetic nature of man. There's an appeal there, but it's not spiritual. And it won't lift you toward God in heaven. Amen. But the Bible said singing with melody in your heart to the Lord. Melody is to be the predominant part of our music. The message that that's the music carries. That's the important thing, uh, the, the message. God help us not to get carried away with worldly music and this modern kind of, kind of stuff. Uh, uh, oh, that God would keep us delivered from contemporary music in the meeting house. Socrates, that ancient philosopher, wrote this, rhythm and harmony are able to imitate desirable moral qualities of character, such as temperance, measure, and serenity, just as they can also imitate the reverse of these qualities. Such rhythms and harmonies in turn can have a permanent and molding effect on the soul, on the character, and habitual feelings of the hearer, inducing it to assimilate grace, proportion, and regulated harmony into itself. That's an ancient philosopher talking about how music can have a permanent molding effect on the life and character and habitual feelings of the hearer. You better be careful what kind of music you're feeding on, friend. Amen. Oh, I thank God he's given us in the holiness rank some wonderful singers that can sing to the glory of God. Why would you go down to the bookstore and some Baptist bookstore, Pentecostal bookstore, and, and uh, get some music from people that don't even have God in their heart. When we can get good music from our, from our young people, from our Bible schools that have God, and our singers that are anointed, and we can get their tapes and listen to that, and it'll lift to. God help us in this area of our music, pageantry, uh, that attraction, uh, oh yes, and also civilization brings advances in the area of dramatics. The heathen out of the, in the early, out there in the jungle and, and in their heathenism, they'll gather around the fire at night and recount the tales of the day. The fella get up and tell his exploits on his hunting expedition. And, and uh, well, but as, as we advance in civilization, things change. And finally, we get to where we have 
we have a camp meeting like this where we can come. And, but also, it evolves into the, into the theater and the stage and the movie house and the television and the video and the dramatics. And there's something appealing about all of that to the human aesthetically. There's a, we have a, something in us that appeals to that. We like to see something like that. Uh, but you know, friend, in this day, if we're not careful, We'll get to a place where we want it all so nice and we get, a, we get it up to such a level that we lose our taste for old-fashioned, rugged, sin-killing, devil-chasing, Holy Ghost preaching. And we got to have it so nice. After all, we're videoing the thing. You know, it's got to be just nice and all this. And, and, and it'll just be a show, mere show, empty display. That's all it'll be. God deliver us from that. Uh, oh, yes, pageantry, uh, pageantry. Perhaps Lot was a little embarrassed uh, to be associated with this vagabond group fresh from Canaan land. Uh, oh, just, uh, he, he liked the show down there. Uh, there's lots of people been blinded by the bright lights out there. They've been blinded till they don't have a love for spiritual things. So a man was going in to, to view a painting of an artist friend. And this artist friend took him into his home and, and they went into a, they passed through a darkened room on their way to the studio and the artist stopped and just visited a little bit with a man just standing there in this semi-dark room. And after they'd visited with him a little bit, he took him on into the studio to see this painting he had just painted. And it was gorgeous. And the man uh, said, oh, this is beautiful. But, but, but I, why did you stop back there in that room and visit in that dark room? He said, because you had the glare of the streets in your eye. And I knew you couldn't appreciate the painting till we got the glare of the street out of your eyes. There's a lot of folk have the glare of the world in their eyes. And they get around the old-fashioned holiness crowd and it's just, it's just, you know, it looks a little ragged to them. It's just not quite up to snuff with what they're expecting. And they've lost their taste. Uh, pageantry. Uh, I want to tell you, friend, you can't feed your soul on pageantry, on aesthetics. Uh, but not only was there pageantry down in Egypt, uh, there was also prosperity. Prosperity. Uh, Egypt was probably the wealthiest nation on earth at this time. Uh, and materialism uh, and affluence were everywhere. Bishop McHenry, that old Methodist bishop, you remember he showed up at conference in Tennessee homespun. They were kind of embarrassed about him, wanted to put him in a broadcloth suit. Uh, you know what he said? He refused to put it on. He said, fine things delude the soul. Fine things delude the soul. Where are we today, anyway? Where are we? Oh, yes. Uh, have, I, I've heard folks say, and I have felt it, you probably have too, a great need in this, in this complex age we live in to, to simplify our lives. Just as, how many have felt that? Just if we could just simplify our lives. I, I'm glad that you feel that way because I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to give you some suggestions on how to simplify your life. First of all, buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. That'd be a good start, wouldn't it? Buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. Second thing, reject anything that is producing an addiction in you. Amen. If you have to have it, get it out of your life. Anything that's producing an addiction in you. Amen. Amen. That'd simplify our lives. Oh, yes. Uh, third, develop a habit of giving things away. If you feel yourself getting attached to something, give it to somebody that needs it. That'd simplify your life, wouldn't it? <laughs> Amen. Oh, yes. Uh, I wonder if some folk are going to be left behind after after because there'd be too much stuff to care for. They've got to stay and take... Well, anyway, number four, refuse to be propagandized by the sellers of modern gadgetry. Yes. You fellas bought you a, a weed eater to trim up your, but you know they got a better model out now. Do a better job, and it's it, it just, it, it just better. So you know what the, the, 
the temptation is to just, you know, got to have the better and the better and the better in every realm. And come up Christmas time and you bought your, you bought your granddaughter a little doll last year that could, uh, it, it could eat and swallow and spit and, uh, and all kinds of things. But this new one that's coming out this year is going to do one thing more. And, and so your poor little granddaughter can't be without. And so you're propagandized by the sellers of modern gadgetry. And the facts are that your little granddaughter would probably be happier with a little corn cob doll like they used to have, dressed in corn shuck. You know, just to be honest, they'd probably have as much fun at least. Uh, oh, yes, but we're propagandized by it all. Refuse to be propagandized by the sellers of modern gadgetry. I'm talking about how to simplify your life. Amen. The next one is learn to enjoy things without owning them. You don't have to own everything. Amen. Why, you, you, can, you can enjoy the public library. There's still some things there or, or a public park or something. You don't have to own everything. Hey, man, get yourself way off in debt trying to buy everything. Oh, there's a lot of things you don't have to buy you can enjoy. Praise the Lord. Oh, then the next one, develop a deeper appreciation for the creation. Learn to enjoy God's good world. Not what man's doing, what God did. Amen. People are blinded to the beauty of God by things man did. What man's done so cheap compared to what God did. Hey man, next thing, simplify your life. Look with a healthy skepticism on all buy now, pay later schemes. That'll greatly simplify your life. Amen. Hey man, uh, just don't get involved in it. Do without it. Amen. Amen. Dollar down and a dollar a month till you die. And you got so many of them coming in, you can't even give the camp meeting. What a shame. Well, then the next one, obey Jesus' instruction about plain, honest speech. And uh, by that I mean don't promise what you can't and shouldn't do. And don't use flattery. That'll simplify your life. <laughs> Amen. Just use plain, honest speech. And then the ninth thing, last thing, shun whatever would detract you from your main goal. What's your main goal? To glorify God. That's our goal in life. Anything that would deflect us from that, shun it. Get away from it. If it keep me from glorifying God. Uh, amen. Prosperity. Prosperity. Down in Egypt. But then there's a third thing was down in Egypt that I think had a had an attraction for a lot, and that was paganism. Paganism, blasphemous worship. The Bible says, learn not the way of the heathen. That's why I don't listen to the sports program on the radio. I don't know what the names of the teams are, what they're playing, or, uh, or all of that stuff. I don't want to know. I'm not interested. Why? Because that's America's God, the sports world. And I'm not bowing at that shrine. Not interested in it. Turn it off when it comes. Don't look at it in the newspaper. Don't read it. Amen. I'm not going to start worshiping false gods. Oh, yes. And you know today we're seeing a worship of man, worship of self. Humanism is a worship of man. It's just ancient shamanism revived. It's a false religion that lifts up man. I was driving down the highway and I saw a great big billboard and it had a, it had a bottle on it. And I don't know enough about it to know whether it's liquor or wine or what it was, but it's a bottle there. And then two words, just two great big words on that sign. It said, reward thyself. And I thought that's the philosophy of this day. I'm the fellow that's got the reward coming. I'm something. I deserve to be rewarded. Look at me. Oh, and so happy if the folk can just kind of clap for me and, and put me up in, uh, on the pedestal and, and exalt me and talk big about me. Reward thyself. Here I am. Oh, yes. What is it? It's just pagan religion. 
That's all it is. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, why the old-time Methodists uh, used to cry out, I nothing have and nothing am. Oh, glory to the bleeding lamb. Uh, oh, friend, uh, this paganism is sweeping the land. Uh, worship of man. Uh, worship of man. Uh, their creed, the hedonist creed, let's have a blast while we last. Just live it up and reward yourself and have a big time. But we're not here to live for self. And have a, we're here to glorify God. Amen. Deflection. But the next thing I think happened a lot, not only deflection, but then there was discontent. Discontent. Discontent with what? The narrow confines of fellowship. They're out of Egypt now, and they're back into Canaan to the lonely life of Canaan. And they were a separate people, a separate people, the lonely life in Canaan, the narrow confines of fellowship. It's wonderful to come to camp and we're all here, but we get back and your church probably isn't bursting at the seams with people. The, pagan, the, the false religion churches are. But in this day, amen, your, your church probably isn't overflowing. There's a few holiness churches around that, that need a, maybe need a bigger building, but most of them, you know, we're working to try to fill the empty pews. Amen. Oh, yes. Uh, Samuel Logan Bringle was a brilliant man and uh, highly educated Methodist. Had opportunity for some of the finest pulpits in Methodism. He could have moved in. They were wanting him. He was, he was wanted. But, uh, and he was very sensitive and highly idealistic man. And being well educated and trained, he, he looked at the Salvation Army and they were made up in that day of largely illiterate and downtrodden people. And his natural, his natural makeup would have drawn him toward the Methodist, the refined congregation the high class situation. But God said, I want you to join up with that little despised group. Uh, and the change of fellowship was not to his natural likings. Uh, but he made a clean break with the old life. He said goodbye to it all and willingly took up the cross. And God made him such a mighty blessing and you just read his books and oh yes uh, oh but there's so many there's discontent uh, the christian's an odd number in this world you know that we really are we're odd uh, odd why you feel supreme love for somebody you've never seen you talk familiarly every day to somebody you, 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 you don't see, and you expect to go to heaven on the merits of another, and you empty yourself in order to be full, and you admit you're wrong to, in order to be declared right, and you go down in order to get up, and you're richest when you're poorest, and you die so you can live, and you forsake everything in order to have anything, and, and you give away so you can keep, and you see the invisible, and you hear the inaudible, and you know the unknowable, and the world looks at you and said, there's the strangest bunch of people I ever looked at. They're odd. They're odd numbers. That's all there is to it. Oh, yes. But the narrow confines of fellowship. You know, there's some who, who profess to love the old-fashioned way who have their dearest friendships among those who despise this way. Their dearest friendships are among those that despise this way. Yet they're professing to love it. Here's a wedding going on, and the bride comes in. The groom is waiting at the front for it, and she comes in. The house is packed with people, and she comes in the door, and she starts down the aisle, and she looks over. Oh, Bill. I say, Bill, we sure had some good times out there on dates, but, but Bill, we can't do that anymore. It's all over. Bye, Bill. Sure enjoyed those good times, but bye. I can't do that anymore. She goes on up the aisle. Oh, Joe. Oh, I remember what a wonderful time we had out there dating together. Joe was wonderful. But Joe, we can't do that anymore. We, I, I can't, can't be doing that anymore. I, I'm sorry, but uh, wouldn't that be something? What would you think? You know, in, in reality, that's what a young lady's doing when she's walking up the aisle. She is saying goodbye 
to everybody that ever was in her life before. Goodbye forever. But she doesn't do it sadly and reluctantly. She walks up that aisle joyfully and looks that young man in the eyes and said, I'll keep thee unto me, unto thee, as long as we both shall live. And it's a joyful thing. And I want to tell you, when you have to kind of you know, you kind of have a longing, you know, out there, and there's kind of a pull and all. There's something wrong. Oh, I glad one day, I gladly took the cross and said goodbye to the world with all its trappings. It wasn't a sad thing. It was a joyous thing. And I said, Lord, as long as I live and for all eternity, I'm married to you. There are no other loves. Uh, praise the Lord. Amen. Oh, yes. Uh, some folk are cramped by the narrow confines. Marriage to the Lord. Oh, they got to reach out. Man lived on the lake. And in, late in the evening, he'd row across the lake, for on the other side of the lake, there was a tavern. It sat right on the lake. They had a dock, boat dock at that tavern, and he'd tie his rowboat up to that dock and go in and drink with his buddies and then when closing time came to close up the tavern he'd get in his boat and roll back home across the lake but one night he really got tanked up he drank more than he normally did come out just drunk as could be and got in his boat and started rowing for home he just rowed and rowed and they got sleepy he'd get kind of a drunken stupor and he slumped in the boat and slept all of a sudden he waked up and the stars were shining and the moon was out and he grabbed those oars and just rode and rode and they got sleepy and, and he was off to sleep again and woke up with a start and the stars are still shining the moon he just starts a rolling and he rode and rode and and he did that several times and he'll fall back to sleep and then all of a sudden he woke up and it was broad daylight and he wasn't home yet and he turned and looked back and he never had untied the boat from the dock have you ever seen some folk that never did untie? They never did untie from the world. They never did let go. Oh, they still have that circle of close fellowship among those that despise this way. Amen. Lot, poor Lot, discontent. Discontent with the narrow confines of fellowship. Oh, the lack of separation will show up on a fellow after a while. It'll show up. Amen. If you, have a, if you have a love for the sports world, it'll get out on you. Amen. A lot of times people's, people's worldliness down in their heart comes out at wedding time when their daughter gets married. Since when did a wedding repeal the laws on modesty? Who said a bride could dress up immodestly at her wedding? Or all the pearls which the Bible clearly condemns, and all of that. Since when, since when did your wedding day become the day when you could forget all about God's holy standards and the bridesmaids and all of them? Amen. And a fella up there in a pink ruffled shirt. Don't even look at me and talk about putting one on. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's right. I don't wear that but which pertained unto a woman. <laughs> Oh, God have mercy on us anyway. A man owned a canary, and he thought that canary's lonely, just hanging in that cage by itself all day long. There it is. So he said, that bird needs company, and he took the cage out and hung it in the tree so it could have fellowship with other birds that fly around, and, and a flock of sparrows came in around that cage. Chirp, 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 chirp. In a little bit, the canary was answering him back. Chirp, 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 chirp. So he brought the canary in at night, hung it on the stand, Chirp, 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 chirp. No pretty song anymore, just chirp. Oh, he thought he'd ruined his canary. He said, what can I do? So he went to the store. He said, I, I, I got to buy a canary. And he bought another canary and brought it home and put it in the cage with the first canary so the, the second one could teach the first one how to sing again. But it didn't work. Wasn't long ago, the second one was going chirp, 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 chirp. You know why some folks get under conviction to have that dark look when God's a moving? The glory's on. They don't fit in at all. Been around where they've been chirping too long. Amen. 
Oh, yes. God help us. Been around with it, been chirping. Oh, but I want to go on. Not only, not only their discontent with the narrow confines of fellowship, but also discontent with a straight jacket of rigid guidelines. Why do we have to have all these rules anyway? All these strange rules. Oh, God said to Abraham, Walk thou before me and be thou perfect. Whew, that's pretty straight, isn't it? Pretty straight. Uh, yes, holiness with standards. Holiness with standards. Uh, yes, we believe in modesty and Christian simplicity. Modesty. Modesty, that means the ladies don't slit their skirts, you know. Hey, Amen. That's it. That's so immodest. Hey, Amen. And not tight. So tight they can hardly walk. Hey, Amen. Allow them to get up on the platform. Can't hardly get up there, up the steps. Have to walk sideways to get up there so tight. God help us. Hey, Amen. Oh, yes. Uh, modesty. Modesty. The devil's trying to make it short somewhere. Yes, he will. Uh, and then, if he can't get you immodest, he'll get you off of the road of Christian simplicity. That holy plainness. Till we begin to take on the finery and the fashions of the world. Modest, yes, but there's just that touch of fashion and style and pride. Oh, yes, that flash about the way we dress. Oh, God, help us to be plain, simple Christians in our dress. Hey, man, uh, oh, this straight jacket. I just don't like, well, bless your heart, if you'll pray through it in the old-fashioned way. There's no bondage in it. It's just glorious freedom. Amen. You talk about free. We're so free, it doesn't matter what the world does. The world's not free. They're all in bondage to what the world's, what's in? You know what's in? It's not in anymore, so we can't do it. Well, we just do what we do. <laughs> what God wants us to do. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Get our styles from heaven. Well, thank God. You're going to have to love me or the devil will get you. Amen. Oh, you say we don't all draw the line in the same place. Well, when the Bible speaks, we have to. Amen. The Bible doesn't say one thing to me and one thing to you. If we're seeing it different, one of us not understand it right. Maybe both of us. But anyway, oh, yes. But, you know, I, there are some areas. I don't, it doesn't bother me for somebody to have a higher standard than I have. That doesn't put me in bondage. And I appreciate them. And I'm not going to reflect on them at all. Amen. That's not legalism to have a high standard. Legalism's a spirit. And I know some blessed, I have some blessed preacher brethren that won't wear a necktie. They're blessed men. I know one of them that a uh, very good friend of mine, he wouldn't put one on, you couldn't get him to. But he told his boy, he said, he said, you'd ought to go ahead and wear a necktie. He said, I think you'd ought to unless God tells you not to. Now, he's not legalistic or he wouldn't have said that. But he won't put one on for anything. You know why? He made a vow back there years ago to God that he would forever. I mean, he made it before the church when they took him in. They used to make him take that vow that will you forever lay aside all superfluous clothing. And they let him know that this was superfluous. And he took a vow. And he said, I, I've got to keep my vow. Amen. Well, that's not, that's not legalism. He's not trying to take my necktie off. You know what bothers me, though? is these folk that move the line. They used to draw the line here, but now they keep moving the line back. They keep making allowances for themselves in some other areas. And they're not as plain as they one time were. And they're not as separated as they one time were. They've just kind of taken in some things. They've moved the line. And they'll say, I haven't changed. Haven't changed. They moved the line. Amen. Oh, that straight jacket of rigid guidelines. And then I think... I think here discontent, maybe it was discontent with the reproach of a nomadic existence. They weren't tied down to earth. I mean, they just, they just went. And, and there, there is a reproach in taking this way with God. We don't always talk about it. You know, I, tell the world my, I tell the world my victories, I tell the Lord my defeats. 
But you know, Abel was murdered. And Joseph was sold into slavery. And Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. And Stephen was stoned to death. And Paul was beheaded. And everyone that lives for Christ in a godless world has suffered some things and endured some pains that he could have avoided by the simple expedient of simply laying down his cross. Yes, you and I are going to face some sufferings along the way. Oh, yes, and then not only to live differently from the world, but to be unattached to it, just living in a tent. Just living around in a tent. That's all Abraham was doing. So unattached to this world. Oh, for here we have no continuing, a continual abiding place. But we seek one to come. Just not attached to this world. Our son had bought a car. It wasn't brand new, but it, it, uh, it looked brand new. It was just really a sharp, and it was a sporty car. Kind of, it wasn't a sports car, but it was a, nice looking car and he was a he was a young evangelist he wasn't married yet but it looked real nice and I had mag wheels on it I guess they call them I don't know and it was a, just a nice two-door coupe looking nice thing just looked brand new and he just had it oh I don't know week maybe I, I don't remember and he and he was coming toward home and and the thing caught on fire just caught on fire he jumped out and Ran, there was a bank right there, ran in the bank, and, and then they called the fire department. The fire department was just down about a, oh, maybe two blocks from where he was. And they got there right away, but the fire raged through and just, and just destroyed the car. And when the firemen were there putting it out, Chris was saying, praise God, glory to God. He said, fellas, my heart's not here. My heart's in heaven. I'm in love with him. He can have the car. I don't need it. I have him. Whew, what a crazy nut we've got here. This beautiful car burnt up and he's shouting and praising God. Oh, yes, I want to tell you, friend, the things of this world, when they become so important. Amen. Amen. Well, i got to hurry on. The next thing, the third thing that down in Egypt that, uh, that I'm afraid cut his eye, and that was... That was discernment. And I mean his lack of discernment. Discernment. And the first thing about his lack of discernment was his appraisal of Sodom. His appraisal of Sodom. He'd gotten off and he'd lost his spirit of discernment. When he began to look at Sodom, he said, it's as the garden of the Lord. You know what that was? That was Eden, the garden of the Lord. He said, this place, Sodom, is so beautiful. It looks just like the Garden of Eden. Why, friend, Sodom was an awful place of wickedness and sin and debauchery. And Eden was a place of purity and perfection and fellowship with God. How could a man be so far off in his perception? How could he be so far off in his appraisal? Something was happening down on the inside. And you can get that way after a while where you lose your discernment. That's why I have relatives, and you maybe do too, that'll shout and praise God. They're skimpy, skimpiest clothes, loaded with jewelry, hair whacked off the women, makeup, and the whole works. Whoo, praise God. Saved and sanctified. We had a wonderful service. God came. Had a dance band playing up on the platform, crashity bangity boom and all that kind of stuff and carrying on and call that God? Yeah, what's wrong? They just lost their discernment somewhere along the line. They're drifting and drifting and drifting. It doesn't happen overnight. It just starts out in little areas where you begin to lose your discernment. Uh, oh, yes, his appraisal of Sodom. Uh, he lost his discernment. And the next thing, I know he lost his discernment because of his attitude towards sin. The Bible said, flee youthful lusts. Uh, why, when he saw the sin of Sodom, he should have run. Uh, but he didn't do it. Uh, Crates uh, that threw his gold into the sea, saying, I will destroy thee, lest thou destroy me. And friend, if men do not put the love of the world and sin to death, the love of the world will put them to death. T.M. Anderson preaching gave us a picture of that imaginary court scene. And here's the accused 
murderer seated there in the courtroom, been accused uh, of uh, murdering a man. And so now the murdered man's wife is on the witness stand. And the murderer is sitting over there that's accused of murdering her husband. And while she sits on the witness stand, she looks over and winks at the man that's accused of murdering her husband, and he winks back. And there's a little flirtation going on between them. You know what would happen? Immediately, that alert jury and judge would say that, that that woman is an accomplice in the death of her husband. And I tell you, friend, when we do not hate the sin that hung Jesus Christ on the cross, there's a strong suspicion that there's a secret alliance down in our soul. Oh, to hate sin, we've got to keep hating sin of every kind. Years ago, very early days of, of our, the movement I'm part of, was a young couple, very talented, just in their 20s. He was appointed to a place of leadership, on a district level, district leader, a very talented couple, both of them. Talented preacher. They were, they were uh, seeing things happen for God, it seemed like. And, and uh, then one day he just resigned, and they just dropped out dropped out and went away into sin. Twenty years passed by, and I was preaching in camp meeting in the state of California, and the preacher's wife came to that camp. She had just gotten back to God. I don't know how many times she'd been married, all mixed up in, in her life, but she'd gotten to God, and here she was. But you know what she said to us? She said, what happened? to my husband back there when we were serving God together. He had grown up in the church. He'd grown up sheltered. And he said to her one day, I've always wondered what it'd be like to do some things. I've always wondered what it's like out there. I've never been out there. I'd like to try it. He never made it back. He's an alcoholic out on the coast in the West now. Life ruined. I don't know how many marriages just thrown to the winds and I, the last I knew, she drifted back out, just gone. Why, curiosity about sin. You'd better run from sin, Fred. You'd better stay away from it. It's deadly in all of its forms. Deadly. And this day, people have lost the fear of God. No fear of God. We can just sin with impunity. But it's not so. It's not so. And then I notice his... his uh, his lack of discernment is also pictured in his abandonment of responsibility. He just abandoned his response. He had a responsibility to Abraham. Everything he had, he got from Abraham. Surely that would, there would be some responsibility there. Oh, yes, I appreciate my heritage, don't you? I feel a responsibility. Amen. Oh, yes, I think about those that went on before. I mentioned in the camp, but I, I've thought about them since I've been here. Walking out across these grounds, I said, Oh, God, would you tell them I'm still trying to hold the line that they taught me back there? Hey, man, all responsibility to Abraham. He had a responsibility to his wife. He had a, you have a responsibility to your companion to help them be everything God would have them be. Responsibility to your children. Oh, you're responsible. What's happened to people when they just let their children go? We rent a parsonage, and the, and the pastor and his wife, that a boy, rebellious. I guess he's probably then about 18 or 19, living at home. How is he doing? They said, we've never talked to him about his soul. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Oh, I can't imagine such a thing. It's a sad day in our home when our children were out of victory. Things just kind of come to a halt. We can't go on this way. People that live in this home serve God. We've got to stop. It's time to pray. We can't go on another day. We all serve God when we live in this home. Amen. What happens to parents when they say, well, we, you just can't make them. You just can't. And all of that. Well, friend, I'll tell you, you can do a lot more than some people think you can do. Amen. I know that. 
Oh, yes, you can't make them serve God. But I tell you, around the home, you can make them line up. Right. Amen. Amen. Like my father used to say, you might as well get saved where you can enjoy it because you're going to live like one when you're at home anyway. <laughs> Amen. Oh, yes. Responsibility to your children. Responsibility to your own soul. And I tell you, friend, no one will ever do anything to you that will give you adequate cause to lay down your responsibility. I don't care how you've been treated. I don't care what they did to you. That doesn't give you any right to lay down your responsibility and quit. Well, I'm not going to help anymore around the camp. I just wasn't treated quite right. Well, bless your puny soul. God wants to give you better victory than that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you'll serve God and love him in spite of what other people do. Do your part. Uh, amen. Leave others if they're not going to do their but leave that to them. Uh, oh, yes. One, uh, it was Bishop Bloomfield who tells of a certain church member saying to him, Do you know I have been a member of this church 50 years, and though I have heard all the great sermons preached in this place, I am still a Christian. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm talking to some people this morning. And you've been lied on, and you've been misrepresented, and you've been resented, or you've been voted against, or you've been criticized, or you've been ostracized, or you've been snubbed, or you've been taken advantage of, or you've been neglected, or you've been preached at, but you're still shouting the victory. Still true to God. Hallelujah. I promise the Lord, I deny not, nor run away when the battle got hot. Gonna keep true to God. Oh, who said you could just lay down your responsibility anyway? No, I'm gonna be true. Praise the Lord. He abandoned his responsibility. Well, but finally, and the last point, the last D, and that's desire. Desire. He got some desires down in Egypt. He got some illegitimate desires. I noticed that he leaned. He pitched his tent toward. Which way is your tent leaning this morning? Which way is it leaning? Oh, I see some folk and I get troubled. They're tense leaning. You couldn't just put your finger on out broken things, but you sense there's a leaning, a leaning. You just wonder if the next storm will just kind of blow it on that way. They're leaning. That's what happened a lot. He leaned in the wrong direction. I want to lean toward God and Calvary. Amen. If I fall, I want to fall toward heaven. Praise the Lord. Oh, I, oh, God help us. I hear some people talk about their inconsistencies and failures, and they just add it up and say, well, you know, my conscience doesn't condemn me. I don't know for sure what's wrong with that, and I just don't. Well, as if their conscience and their own insight were sufficient uh, substitutes for the Word of God. Amen. Oh, leaning in the wrong direction. Did you ever see a fly take a bath? You didn't even know they took baths. They do. They do. You ought to watch one take a bath once. You know what a fly does when he takes a bath? He holds his wings way up. And then he'll get himself down. It just takes a little puddle for a bath. That's all it takes. I mean, a little drop. And he'll get down in that drop and he'll just flop all around. But all the time his wings are way up. You know why? That fly's got enough sense to know. If his wings get wet, he's done flying. He's got to be able to fly. To get away if problems come, if danger, whatever. So he keeps his wings up and keeps them dry. And when he gets all done, his, those wings take off and away he goes. Amen. Well, you and I have to live in this world. This is, this is our place of labor. But I'm glad we can keep the wings of our faith. The wings of prayer. We can keep our spiritual wings up, uh, uncontaminated from the world, ready to take our flight to the glory world at a moment's notice. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, well, uh, he leaned, but then, but then he was liked. He was liked. He sat in the gate. I don't know what that means to you. Commentators tell me that means maybe he was on the city council. Uh, and I read one that said that meant he was the mayor of the town. Because the mayor said, I don't know what that meant, but he was liked. He was liked. You know, there's some folk that 
if they get around and they, they, they just kind of give in to that palaver, they're liked. There was a man, place I pastored, his, his wife had a heart problem, flare up, I don't know exactly what it was, I, I, I knew but I can't remember now just what the problem was, but anyway, she needed immediate medical attention. But they called 911, and that little town where they lived had two ambulances. And both ambulances, one was down at one tavern and another was down at another tavern. They were having knife fights at both taverns. And the ambulances were all tied up. That lady laid there and died. And the doctor said there would have been no problem saving her if they'd have got there. It was a useless death. And this man wasn't a Christian at all, that man or lady. But I learned about it from somebody in the church. They were recount, they, they'd somehow heard about it. And so I went to see him. And he was, he was pretty bitter about it all. And he said, how could there be a God? There's no God. Something like that couldn't happen. I said, oh, oh, sir. I said, there is a God. And I said, that ought to bring comfort to your heart because God's appointed a day in which he's going to bring the world to judgment. And all these wrongs, are going to be made right. It's all going to come out someday. God's going to straighten everything out someday. He's going to, it's all, there's nothing going to be covered in that day, but all the injustice is going to be painted out there. It's all going to come, everything going to be out in the open. He said, oh, I never thought about that. And God seemed to melt his heart. And we prayed and he cried and prayed and then he came to church and it looked like maybe we'd have a chance to help the man. And but also this, of course, this thing was in the paper and a cult, a false cult read about it. Went down to that man's house. We were trying to help the man. I had some of the ladies in the church carry some food to him. And, you know, we invited him to, home, to our home for a meal or whatever. We tried, we tried to help. But this false cult went there and moved right in. I mean, two ladies just moved in the home with him. We, we couldn't do that. It was an immoral situation, but they did. He had some money. He wasn't broke. He, he, he was worth something. And they were after the money. They got it too. He told me one day I went by there, he had just given them a check for 30000 And that was just one of I don't know how much they got out of him. But they just moved right in and gave him that attention. Ironed his shirts and cooked his meals and did his laundry and did the whole thing. And, and uh, he was so liked. And I, I, I just got playing with him. And talk, talk to him about that false cult and showed him it's not, it's not according to the Bible. But he would just like, and it, it did something to him and we couldn't help him. And uh, some people get carried away. Oh, yes, light, uh, light friendship of the world is enmity with God. Friendship of the world. Uh, he was liked and then he was linked. He was linked. Genesis 19, he said to the men of Sodom, brethren, brethren, why they were wicked, immoral, ungodly men. He said, brethren, he was linked. He had son-in-laws there. His family got all involved and intermarried. You say, you can't tell your children who to marry. No, but I can tell them who not to marry. I can. Right. Amen. Oh, I say, I can't stop. This place a while back, it said, uh, Preacher's daughter took up with a fellow from a false religion. He said, what could I do? I'll tell you what I could do. I could stop it. Yes, sir. If, my, if that's my daughter living at my home, I'd stop it. You don't think I could? I could. <laughs> oh, yes. That's, that's the problem. We've got such weak need. That's it. Amen. I don't know what else to call them. Oh, yes. Amen. God help us. Not, we're not going to throw them away to the devil and the dogs. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, oh, yes, he was linked. Uh, he was linked. Uh, oh, his wife, all of her ties were in Sodom. Everything she loved was back there. If she had to leave Sodom, nothing was left. Oh, the corruption of Sodom even clung to him. And he carried it out to the cave. Uh, who knows where sin will lead him or disobedience or drawing back just begin to draw back and pull back a little bit and pull back. Family, I don't know their whole history, but he was a holiness preacher and pastored in some of our churches. 
It seemed like I didn't know him well, but it seemed like good people, good people. But something happened along the way. Their kids and teenagers, I don't know what happened, drifting, drifting, and then little problems, and finally they out of the ministry, and then just attending the church, just attending. You're not going to be good layman. You can't be a good layman with a call to preach. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh, if God's called you to, God's called, it's just hard, you know, to, to fit in where you're not called. Well, anyway, anyway, they finally had some problems with the preacher or something. I don't know what it was. They kind of dropped out and started off to some other church that doesn't preach holiness. And then just, this is just very recent. They had somebody come in and commercially clean their carpets, cleaned them all up. And the lady smelled something in the house. She, it was strange. She, she thought, you know, this carpet's been cleaned. Don't know what it is. She opened all the windows and tried to air the place out. And, and the children went to school across the street, to school, public schools now. And uh, they're going to come home at noon. It's this order in this house. She said, I'll get it out. I'll light a little candle, one of these scented candles. She struck a match to light the candle, and there was a tremendous explosion. And the place caught on fire, and she was cooked. She walked out on the front porch, and the flesh just hanging all off of her. And her children came running across the street. And I don't know all the stories. She fell there. They, they, they called for help and sent for the Lifeline helicopter to get her came in. They said it just, when they went to pick her up, now it was just like picking up a charred piece of board that still has its form, but it's just powder. That's the way she was. She was just burned all through, and she was gone, gone, just drifting. And if she could just turn back the clock, just a few years where she started that drift, I'll tell you today, she'd be glad. She'd be glad. She could, if she could turn back the clock and stop the drift. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. was down in Texas years ago in a revival meeting, and he said that, well, one night a layman came to him and said, Brother Jones, did you read in the paper about that preacher up in the state of Maine? Dr. Jones said, yes, I did. There was a news, it come out on the news that a preacher had been arrested and accused of murdering a lady in the state of Maine. That layman said, Brother Jones, I don't believe it's true. They framed up on the man. I know him. I've had him in my home. He was my pastor, a good godly man. He didn't do it. It's something, something's wrong. The next morning, Dr. Jones said, I got the morning paper and read in there the account, and the man in his jail cell confessed that he'd murdered the woman had an affair with her, and then murdered her. And so he said that night, that layman came in, his head drooping. He said, Brother Jones, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Why, just two years ago I was with that man. He was a good man. He was a holy man. How could he do it? He said, Brother Jones said, Brother, two years ago that man would never have dreamed He'd do such a thing. But you can't start down a road of disobedience and keep God. And he began to flirt in his mind. The preacher preached about that last night out in the mind into, in the wrong areas. And he allowed it. And after a while, it got in his heart desire and then the deed and, and then murder to cover the deed. There it is. Never dream. Never dream. And you'll never, you could never dream where you'll end up if you began like Lot. Just begin like Lot, just by a little deflection and turning off the course and not just staying with the old-fashioned, radical, plain, Christian way. After a while, the drift will be on and you won't even realize it. You won't even know you've drifted. Till they'll say, Gray hairs are here and there upon him, and he knoweth it not. Uh, he doesn't even seem to realize he's drifted. He's drifted. God, help us to stay in the old paths. Where is the good way?